Hello, my name is James Bundy and I'm the Director of Operations for Freedom Declared Foundation. I'm delighted to be joined today by the Bishop of Paisley, Bishop John Keenan, as we discuss the state of freedom of religion or belief in the United Kingdom. But before we discuss that, I think it's appropriate to define what we mean by freedom of religion or belief. So Bishop John, what do you understand freedom of religion or belief to mean? Do you know, I, I understand it to, to mean pretty much what the UN um, Declaration Article 18 says, which is pretty consonant with the catechism of the Catholic Church. So it's um, freedom of um, thought and conscience, freedom of belief and religion. It, it, it's freedom to uphold those beliefs. It's freedom to express those beliefs, not just in your faith community, but um, to be free and serene in expressing them as a, a citizens in a, in a civic society. Uh, it, it also it means the freedom not to believe certain things. It means the freedom um, to, to change uh, our, our beliefs as well. Uh, and it, as I say, to hold those in, in a community. So that would be my understanding, pretty much standard, along with um, the UN um, uh, declaration and the catechism. And not an absolute right, um, it has limitations, but those limitations have to be reasonable, they have to be uh, well argued, and they have to be uh, pretty um, strict. And how do you think uh, freedom of religion or belief is being implemented in the UK today? Uh, well, do you know, I, I think we want to have a perspective on this. I always begin by really by saying that, that um, we're fortunate, um, Catholics are fortunate, I think, to live in the West. I think we're fortunate to live in, in, uh, in Britain, and I think we're fortunate to be able to do so at this time in the, in the history of the world. Um, it, you know, we only have to take a, a, a flight five, six hours um, east or, or, or nine, ten hours south, and we see that um, our fellow uh, Catholics, Christians, people of faith, are living with, with real persecution, that um, to be able to uh, hold beliefs or to, to worship puts their, their lives, uh, their livelihoods in, in um, immediate and present danger. That's not the case um, in, the, in, the, in the UK, I think, in, in the UK, that um, things are, 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 are fairly, fairly good. Um, that said, you know, the price of peace is eternal vigilance, and there are some worrying signs, I think, on the, on the horizon. I think there are some growing pressures as the, the world becomes more secularised. Um, I, I think there's a less of an understanding of what religion is and what it means to have religious rights and religious belief. And I think in certain quarters, uh, an aggressive secularism um, really does seem to want to undermine uh, religious uh, belief and, and practice. So I think those are things that we do have to uh, be concerned about. And I think there is a, a general concern among um, religious and faith communities that there's um, growing pressure on, on, on these internationally declared human rights. You say to that um, these... Uh, Article 18 is not an absolute right, and it does have some limitations. Uh, what uh, would those limitations be in, in your eyes? Well, the ones that are, are, are spoken of is that um, a due respect for the rights and freedoms of others. So that um, I, a, work with, uh, the understanding of, of human rights in a, in, a, in a human community is that my own um, exercise of my rights uh, and my freedoms um, shouldn't be, uh, abrogate the, the just rights and freedoms of others. That's, that's um, absolutely fine. But now there's a, a growing question in our own um, uh, times as to whether the exercise of my rights um, it, it should not offend others' feelings. Now, that's, that's a debate, isn't it? So, um, it, it, you know, someone um, has, may have different point of view or belief from me. Now, I can say, well, I have my beliefs and I respect your right to have yours. 
these are this is my point of view and I respect yours. But and I and I believe you have a right to hold those and I have a view that you I believe that you have a right to express those and live by them. But I've got a right to disagree with you as to whether um that what way that, what you're what you're holding is, is correct. Now um there's there's a, a growing um a there's a growing sense that um, if if what I say hurts someone's feelings, then they've got a right not to have their feelings hurt, uh, which is a kind of subjective thing, which means that therefore my right to the certain certain Catholic beliefs that, that people feel offended by. Well, if, if I have a right not to be offended, then 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 that might mean that there's a there's a pressure on my my right to be able to express my my beliefs and my practice. So that's that's one thing. Another another thing is that um, that rights are are, are uh, to be um, duly reasonably restricted when it's a question of uh, well the United Nations Declaration and, and the, the Church says um, questions of public morality, or general morality, or or the health and the well being of others. So again, those are those can be when when the world becomes our, our, our worldview becomes more subjective. Those can be subjective terms. Uh, so, what is it again? If I, uh, some of some some Catholic views are, are held to be undermining the health and well-being of others. Uh, so, if um, if if I it, it, could someone say, well, you're not entitled to express your beliefs or hold your beliefs because either holding those beliefs or expressing them, it can have a a detrimental health, health, health um, effect on others' well-being and health. So those are, those are genuine questions of debate just now. They're genuine questions. They are, they are real questions of debate, let's say. But they do have implications on um, freedom to, to believe and to practice uh, our own faith. Yeah, and uh, you also said um, earlier on that we are in a very fortunate position in the West, and I think no one denies that. Uh, in Scotland in particular, the past uh, year has seen various headlines with anti-Catholic uh, within uh, the headline. Do you think members of the church in Scotland feel that they can fully express their uh, belief either in public life or even in their daily life? Um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a good question. It's a a question of really discernment, I think, uh, James, because first of all, our freedom is is freedom under the law and according to the law. And so it, it may well be the case that so it may well be the case that some anti-Catholic comments, slogans, things like that um, are being made and, and there is there as much as ever. They may even be increasing what we just saw. Um, last night, for example, that our, our national Marian shrine was vandalised um, at the same time as uh, the outside of one of our churches close by to to Carfin Shrine was 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 vandalised as well. We're seeing those kinds of things. Um, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a a new kind of anti-Catholic sentiment, uh, which is different from the anti-Catholic sentiment of the past. Is seems to be a little bit on the rise, but that's a that's that's a sentiment in certain aspects of society, probably very much in a minority. The laws would still consider those that, that act of vandalism a crime. Uh, so the so, so the laws. It's, so we, we still may well have freedom under the law, but um, it, the the Declaration of Human Rights and our understanding of rights is is freedom in the social polity, not just conceptually according to the law. And, um, you know, so the whole social polity, the whole political or civic polity, should be doing what it can to ensure that uh, rights aren't just enshrined in law, but uh, are, are respected in society. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned earlier as well about aggressive secularism. Uh, do you have any examples of what of what that consists of? Well, I think probably to be fair, we could just take the word aggressive. <laughs> uh, first of all, there's there's an aggressiveness 
growing in society now, isn't it? Um, that uh, the philosopher Nietzsche, he he believed that 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 that, that society's progress, um, if we really understood it, are, are predicated on our will to power. Now, our our own um, Catholic understanding um, would be more that society's development developed uh, in terms of a search for the truth, a common search for the truth. Well, there's two, those, those are two competing views of, of, of progress in society, a, a genuine search for the truth on the one hand, or a will to power on the other. If we're, if we're trying to, if our society is developing on the basis of truth, then what we do is we have conversations and debates Someone makes a proposition and, and tries to um, give evidence for it and give reasons for it. But the other person might say, well, having considered your reasons and your evidence, I disagree with you. Because disagreement is a faculty of the intellect. And that seemed to be the way things went until maybe a generation ago. Someone would say, I disagree with you and here's why. Um, and we can progress on that basis. Nowadays, uh, it, it seems to me to be more like a will to power. So I make a proposition, I give reasons and I give evidence. Someone doesn't say, I disagree with that, I haven't considered the reason and the evidence. They say, I find that offensive. Now, offensive, to be offended is not an operation of the intellect, it's an operation of the will. It's not concerned about evidence or reasoning. Uh, and it's just an operation of the will because I want um, certain powers, and, I, and, and if you're standing in my way, no matter the strength of your argument, it doesn't matter because it's impeding my will to get what I want. So I think that it can be seen across society, it creates an aggressiveness. People say it's fueled by social media, it's not caused by social media. I think it's caused in, in, some, in something deeper is, is our society, if our society is based on willfulness, I want, I get, then it's going to become more aggressive. If it's based on, on um, I, 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 we all want the truth no matter what it is, then it, it should be based on more considerations. I think whatever there are debates just now, um, it, whether it be religion or not, uh, there's an aggressiveness that is dispiriting and demoralizing society and social debate. Everyone talks about it, even though very few of us seem to know what to do about it or how to reverse the engines on it. But it would be also, it, it's equally the case, that aggressive secularism is it, 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 the, equally the case, I think, in religion. One of the, um, one of the, the, the areas that we've found is recently um, a hate crime act was passed in, in, in Scotland, still to come into force, but um, our own Scottish bishops were engaged um, actively in the, in the process of, of consultation. And we were concerned that a kind of secularism was saying that, that religious um, rights and rights of, of people of faith are subordinated now to other rights. So it's not that all fundamental rights stand in a creative tension. Now there's an idea that equality trumps the rights to, to, to belief in religion. Uh, and that's come from a more secular idea or a secular anthropology, but it's now, I think, overtly saying religion and belief should um, play second fiddle to the uh, understanding of, of, of equality. That was certainly there in the act, so that whereas there were strong protections against those who might um, speak out against religious belief in practice, if you, if you were to um, say really strong things against uh, Catholicism or Christianity or, or, or other religions, you are protected um, in, in law in terms of this hate crime act. But if you were to say something quite strong or clear against things like sexual orientation or, or gender identity, then you weren't protected. So there was two separate standards, um, depending on whether it was... Uh, so religion is a protected characteristic. Identity was a protected characteristic, but two in different levels. Mm -hmm. And do you think that comes from... Uh, religious illiteracy. You mentioned that as well. Um, that's been on, uh, well, religious literacy has been on a decline. Do you think uh, that's the hate crime bill and everything else, um, the 
you say the two standards, is that deriving from this religious illiteracy? I think we saw the religious illiteracy more in the um, in the COVID scenario and the, the, the closing down of our of our churches. Um, um, religious illiteracy is um, you know it's it, it's it, it's an innocent um, sort of thing, isn't it? Insofar as uh, as the country becomes more secular. Uh, it, the stories, the Christian stories now, the Judeo-Christian stories, are less formative of our culture. So our, 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 our British population wouldn't know the, the, the Bible stories, the Judeo-Christian stories, wouldn't have a first-hand understanding of religion, wouldn't have a first-hand uh, understanding of faith. May well, more and more people are living um, without faith or belief or even the experience of it in any personal way and that's also going to be the case with with politicians and and, and lawmakers and policy makers so um, our our government and our parliament has less um uh, people of, of faith than it would have had in the past so that that naturally gives a kind of illiteracy i mean that's just as sure as night fall as day there's a certain illiteracy and i think we found that um so for example, when um, when uh, the, the pandemic was at its height, I, first time round, the, the government came to the churches and faith communities and discussed with them about closing down of our churches, which, to be honest with you, we were in favour of. And so it meant first time round, the government asked the, the faith communities to close their churches, and we did that. Second, in the second lockdown, they didn't ask us. They, they simply closed them down without asking us and I think there was a lot there was more kickback then from um, citizens of faith than there had been first time around because uh, uh, they, th th there was an element of trust that their own religious leaders had taken this decision but there was there, there wasn't the same trust when, when, when the state was making decisions about the religion another example was when the government um, identified four harms that um, could be caused by the lockdown and financial and human and, and other. Um, and it identified, a, 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 to its credit, identified a harm when, when uh, places of worship were closed, but it was a social harm. It, it, it didn't have a, it doesn't ha have an awareness of the transcendental, the transcendent harm, the spiritual harm that, that, um, that uh, an under kind of an understanding that that spirituality is just really psychology uh, to do with holy things, rather than a real connection with a supernatural being that, that, that gives real, real grace and real life for us all. So there was that illiteracy. Now, I, when I say it was in this, I think the government very quickly wanted to learn. Uh, and so uh, quite soon after that second uh, set up, um, fora between the religious leaders and their, their lead civil servants in the connected communities um, department. And those are now ongoing in, in belief and religion units. So I think there's a, there's a genuine uh, attempt in, in, in the government and the Scottish Parliament to understand better religion. That's not to say for them to become religious, but to understand better what religion is is something quite distinct. And we're going to have as is going to be the case south of the border, there's going to be, now we're going to have the, the COVID inquiries to see how uh, to assess the government's response to, to the pandemic. And certainly one of the points that we will be making is uh, that, uh, that the way the government responded actually led to uh, Christian citizens taking a judicial review, which was successful, which uh, ended in saying, uh, judging that the government had uh, had. Um, they broken the, uh, the international conventions in uh, 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 to do with um, rights of religion and faith. And, uh, so I think we all want to take that forward. What, 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 what can we learn? Uh, what can we learn there? Where, where, it's, where it's religious uh, illiteracy or faith illiter illiteracy, I think there's room for progress when when it's a hostility against religion, which is in certain parts. That's that's more tricky. Yes, and. I guess my final question will be, 
But on top of those dialogues with government and uh, members of parliament, what is the best way to raise religious literacy across the, the population uh, so people understand the importance that faith plays in people's lives? I mean, I think that's, that's a, a good question. I do think um, you know, one of the, the, the ways to um, spread religious literary, literacy is, is also to improve it in the faith communities. Um, the faith communities don't exist um, outside of the world as if um, Catholics are from Mars and Scottish citizens are from Venus. Um, we live in the same world. Catholics are are one at the same time as citizens and the church um, lives in the world and not of the world. But it would be naive to say that the, the church in Scotland, the Catholic Church in Scotland, hasn't been affected also by secularization by some of the, the trends in contemporary society. And I, and I think probably uh, we might want to make an effort in um, as, as, as a a, a, a Catholic community and our families and our parishes and our schools in improving the religious literacy of, of, of Catholics. So that, um, I, you know, as, as, uh, as Newman famously said, this is what he wanted of, of Catholic laity, you know, enough knowledge to know what they believe and why they believe it, enough of a sense of the history to give an account of it. And, uh, Peter said to the early Christians, always be ready to give um, reasons for the hope of the faith um, to which you have um, uh, adhered. So I, I do think, uh, you know, uh, as a Catholic community, every, if we can get to the point where more and more Catholics know what they believe and why they believe it, and understand their vocation to be salt, leaven, and light in the world, that the, that the, the faith that they profess is a faith which is for the good of society and to have the confidence to be able to take their faith into society, then that will be salt, leaven and light, I think, in uh, increasing the literacy of, of, of Scottish society uh, in terms of Christianity and Catholicism. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bishop John Keenan. That uh, has been very interesting, this whole interview, uh, and yeah, hearing your thoughts about uh, the state of freedom of religion or belief in the UK and in particular Scotland. And so thank you very much for your time. James and uh, God bless all the work of Freedom to Pledge Foundation and uh, we're grateful for what it's doing in, in uh, trying to gather personal perceptions of, of how um, uh, faith and belief are, are, are protected in their freedoms and to try to get that across to institutions in, in, in our country so that uh, we can understand better what, what these very precious um, rights mean. Thank you very much for your prayers, Bishop Keenan. This is going to be the first of many interviews that we hold on a state of freedom of religion or belief in the UK. So please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter to stay up to date with all the latest interviews as they come out. And you can also sign up to our mailing list on our website. All the links will be below on the YouTube video. Uh, thank you once again, Bishop Keenan, thank and you. I hope that you have a, a nice uh, rest of your day. And you too. Thank you.